Good morning, welcome to church, how are you? Good, good. So glad to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. My name is uh, Landon McDonald. I grew up in Chicago. We got any Chicago people here? Yeah. Kind of ashamed of it at this point? Or <laughs> I moved here and my nephew called me and he was like, are you still gonna be a Bears fan? And I was like, I just don't hate myself enough um, to do that. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so glad that you guys are here. Do you have your Bible? Go ahead and grab your Bible, and we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 81 today. Um, we're in a series called The God I Wish You Knew. We're going to be looking at an aspect of God that is not popular but is extremely true, which is that God brings good from difficulty. God brings good from difficulty. I also got this amazing pic of my fam. It's looking so good. And I wanted to show that to you. My son scored in his basketball game yesterday for the first time, and it was amazing. And I've watched the video about 100 times when I should have been preparing for the sermon, so if it's not as good as you thought, that's the reason why. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is what this sermon is about. Listen to God, because he brings good from difficulty. That is something that God does for Christians. It doesn't seem like it, it doesn't feel like it, but it is true. Talk with people who've been following Christ for long enough and you'll find out that there are many things in their life that were extremely difficult, extremely painful, extremely frustrating. You wouldn't have chosen it, you didn't want it, and uh, you stuck with it. And then over time, God turns that thing into something sweet in your life. Has anyone experienced that? We're gonna see that in, amen. We're gonna see that in God's word this morning. Here's what's gonna happen in this sermon. I like when you go to like a wedding or something and they just tell you what's gonna happen. Does anybody else like that? Or is anybody else like me? You're like watching a movie on Netflix and you're just like, this is pretty long. So you pause it to see how much is left. <laughs> and you're like, is it worth it? Or you're at the movie theater and you're like, how long is this movie? Because you want to know. Anybody else? Uh, <laughs> it's like, we get it, Marvel. Like, we get how much you can do. It's like, two hour and 49 minute films. Like, I don't have that much time. Like, I'm tired. Like, anybody else? No? Okay. This, <laughs> this is what the sermon is this morning. I'm going to do the intro. That already happened. So that was, that was the thing. That just happened. That part is over. And it's never coming back. That was it. We're gonna teach uh, straight through Psalm 81. So I'm gonna go straight through the whole Psalm with you and we're gonna isolate these two ideas, which is the key themes of the text, which is listening to God and then the rocks of difficulty. And then we're gonna talk about the beauty that comes from pain. And then at the end of the service, I'm gonna invite you with me to pray a prayer of surrender to God for something difficult in your life. That's where we're headed today. So let's look here. Do you have your Bible open to Psalm chapter 81? If you do say, I'm there. I'm there. All right. Here's what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 81. It says, sing out loud to God our strength for joy to the God of Jacob. That's what we just did. We're singing out loud to God. We're rejoicing in God. Last week was absolutely iconic. I don't know if you were here. Kevin was just talking about it. We baptized all these people. I just didn't wanna go home. I was like, who else wants to get baptized? Like, let's hang, like, let's just keep singing. And no one was leaving. And that feeling and that experience of being like, I don't want to stop singing. I love God. I wanna keep singing. Have you ever gotten to the end of a worship set and you're like, I wish they had like three more songs, you know? That is the vibe that he's going for in Psalm 81. Then he says this, raise a song, sound the tambourine. Anybody grow up Pentecostal or somebody just brings a tambourine to church? This is an unsupervised tambourine in the audience. <laughs> and I don't know if you grew up in a church like that, but it's never the person that has good rhythm <laughs> that is the self-appointed tambourine player. They're just kind of showing up with it. That's a very loud instrument. That can overpower many people's worship in the section that they're in. <laughs> the sweet lyre with the harp. The lyre is kind of more like a guitar type instrument. And the harp, obviously, is the instrument that we know that David played. 
uh, blow the trumpet at the new moon. It, it actually isn't trumpet in Hebrew. It's actually an instrument called a shofar, which is like a ram's horn. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but if you ever go to Israel, make sure you go and hang with a Jewish guy who has a shofar. They're very hard to blow, but they're, it's a very cool instrument. It's a sounding for bringing people's attention to something. That's the idea. Bringing people's attention to the worship of God. Blow the trumpet at the new moon and at the full moon on our feast day. They're talking about something from Leviticus, probably the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I just must know, do we have any Bible geeks that attend this church, or is it just me? Because I love this stuff. Like when I see that, I'm just like, let's do the rest of the sermon on this bit, right? That's the, that's the worst response I have ever gotten from a question in my 15 years of ministry. I just asked if there's any Bible geeks and no one said anything. That is so discouraging to me. See, so you got one person. Sad. Shaking my head up here. <laughs> so. For it is a statute for Israel. It is a rule of the God of Jacob. How amazing is that? What are the rules in Israel? Hey, one of the rules at this country of God is that we praise God. That is a rule, and not like a robotic rule, like you have to do it. Like a rule, this is what we do here. This is the way we are here. We love to worship God. We love to sing to God. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. What decree? This idea of worshiping God, of praising God, of offering up a sacrifice of praise to God. The psalmist says, I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. He's now directly quoting God from when they were in Egypt. So the idea is that they lived in Egypt, they didn't understand the language of Hebrew, and they heard God speak to them, and he said this, I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. That's like the, you're carrying mud and you're carrying bricks, and they're in slavery in Egypt, building the pyramids, doing all the horrible stuff they had to do. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. God is giving us an insight here into who he is, He's saying, you know how you don't understand thunder? That's where I live. I live in the clouds and I heard you. Because when we're in pain and we call to God, God hears us. If you had a rough week this week and you were praying to God, God heard you pray to him. In your distress, when you called to God, God is not uh, absent, he's not screening your prayers, he's not not listening, he hears you, he cares, he's listening to you in your pain, he sees your tears, he cares about what's on your heart, and in the difficulty of life, God hears you, he answers you, just like it says, I tested you at the waters of Meribah. That's a reference to an Old Testament story where the people of Israel were complaining for no reason, which is like 80% of the Old Testament. And they were complaining, and then God brought them water out of this rock. So they were thirsty, and they were like, we don't want this trash salt water. Like, it's just gonna make us more thirsty. Like, give us some of that real deal, like smart water, like cloud water. This is what we want. And then God sent Moses to bring it to them. The point of it, of what he's saying is this. Listen to God. He brings good from difficulty. He's like, you saw it. You saw it at Meribah. You saw it there. You saw what I do. You don't have water. I bring you water. I'm a good God. I listen to you. So listen to me. Like God is like, just listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm telling you. Hear all my people while I admonish you. Oh, Israel, if you would but listen to me. Every parent of a child between the ages of two and five is like, I have said these very words. If you would but listen to me, then there would be no strange God among you. you. You shouldn't bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Notice that that kind of stands out in the text, doesn't it? It's a pretty interesting turn of phrase, a pretty interesting thing for him to say. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. 
Some Bible commentators think that this is a reference to a story of a sultan in the Middle East world who was so happy with one of his party guests that he actually put a bunch of diamonds and jewels on his sword and went up to the guy and said, open your mouth and started brushing all of the diamonds and rubies into the guy's mouth, which I've been to a lot of parties and I've never quite seen anything like that. <laughs> um, some people think that it's actually not a reference to that. Some people think, but, but, but the Sultan story definitely brings up the, the image of this guy <laughs> in my mind. Anybody like the film Aladdin? Um, no, pastor, that's not a Christian movie. I would never watch that movie. Um, <laughs> this is what I think of when I think of a uh, Sultan. This is actually is the movie where I learned, uh, when I was a kid, I learned that there is a religion called Islam. I was, I was watching this movie and I went into the next room. I was like, hey dad, who is Allah? And he's like, what are you watching in there? Uh, <laughs> Listen to God, he brings good from difficulty. Another story about um, the open your mouth wide, I will fill it. Uh, it's an Eastern custom that at a party, the head of the household would grab the fattiest dripping piece of meat with his bare hand and literally put it into the mouth of his most prized guest. We think that that is gross. That is the idea here. The idea is that um, go to God and surrender. Tell him what you need. He's like, open your mouth wide, I will fill it. It's like the baby bird just with the widest open mouth in the nest with the mom. Like, I just, I know what I need and I know where I can get it. I can get it here from you, God. That's the idea that the text is saying. Okay, just a few more verses here. Verse 11. How long is this chapter? <laughs> Pastor's really got something to prove on his first Sunday. Too much text. <laughs> but my people didn't listen to my voice. Israel wouldn't submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. This is a danger for every Christian. Listen to God. If you don't listen to God, he might give you over to the emotions that you think you want. Then you're stuck in that place to follow their own counsels. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. Oh, we got that printed twice there. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies. God's like, if you would just listen to what I'm saying, I would fix your problem. I would give you what you need. Just come to me and surrender and tell me that you know that I've got it and I'll give you what you need. He's like, I would subdue their enemies. I would turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate God would cringe toward him. He's like, I would rescue you so, miracul so miraculously that people would look at me and see how amazing I am and their fate would last forever. This is my favorite part of the text. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. He's like, come to me and I will give you what you need. God is saying to you today, Christian, come to me and I will give you what you need and I will show you, I will show you that there is sweetness that comes from difficulty. I will show you that there's beauty that comes from brokenness. I will show you the purpose in your pain. It may have felt random to you, but it was not random. I gave you that test or that trial for a reason or a purpose. I love you. I'm turning it around for your good. I will show you the good in the pain of your life. I will bring you to a place of surrender where you can truly in your heart say to me, thank you, God. I will bring the beauty out of the ashes of your life. Just listen to me and let me do it. And amen. Amen. He's like, I would feed you with the finest of the wheat, to which people are like, but, but, but God, I'm, I'm, I've got like a gluten kind of thing. Um, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm the bread of life. And someone's like, that's great. Do you come in sourdough? Um, <laughs> God provides manna for the people of Israel. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, 
got more jokes coming into my mind, but it just feels like it's a, that was enough. <laughs> I think that was, that was enough of them. Um, <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, who's one of my favorite theologians, that's the point of the text, he said this about this exact text. He said, when his people walk in the light of his countenance and maintain unsullied holiness, the joy and consolation which he yields them are beyond conception. To them, the joys of heaven have begun, even upon the earth. They can sing in the ways of the Lord, The spring of the eternal summer has commenced with them. And they're already blessed. And they look for even brighter things. God says, with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Which is this idea that I'm so excited to share with you right now. Which is that God doesn't bring sweetness to life in spite of your pain. He brings sweetness to life from your pain, which is a lot, a lot harder to believe and a lot more beautiful of a thing when it happens. Because notice what it says in the text. You can look down at your Bible, verse 16. It says, with honey, with sweetness, with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. The rock is the difficult thing. It's the rock at Meribah. It's the rock in your life. It's the difficult, painful thing that you have been unable to get over or is happening now or, sorry to say, is coming in your future. It's the thing that when you get to it, you're like, maybe I made a mistake following Christ. It's the pain that when you feel it, you're like, I thought he was supposed to make my life better. It's the thing that when you experience it, you're like, I don't even know if I wanna keep rolling with this. And this idea is so beautiful for any person in that place today that God doesn't bring sweetness to life in spite of your pain. He brings sweetness to life from your pain. And we see this all throughout the Bible. This is everywhere in the Bible. We see this in the story of Abraham. He gets promised a son, and then he has to wait 25 years for his son, and he's like, my wife already went through menopause, God. Like, this is a disaster. And then he waits, and that's the rock, and the honey is Isaac. We see it in the story of Joseph. He gets all these promises from God, and then he has to wait for his entire life for them to come true. He's sitting in jail, and then at the end of his life in Genesis 50, 20, he says, you know what? Everybody in my life meant everything for evil, but God meant it for good. He's like, there was honey in the rock for me. I was in jail, and God was doing something in me that I didn't understand because God brings sweetness from things that are difficult. It's the same thing in Moses' life. He was in exile, then he gets a purpose. It's the same thing in Joshua's life. It's the same thing in Ruth's life. It's the same thing in Nehemiah's life. It's the same thing in Ezra's life. It's the same thing in Haggai's life. It's the same thing in Esther and Hosea's life. They have this request that they've made of God. They're waiting for it. God has promised them something. Esther, he brings vindication. That's the honey. And Hosea gets a prophetic word. That is the honey for him. That God brings sweetness to our life, not in spite of our pain, but from our pain. Um, I I love honey. There's this roadside stand at the corner of, um, what is it, Sossaman and Picos. I heard there's one down the street from here. Is there one? Is there a honey stand around here? Yeah. That, I, I, I admire those guys. I don't know if you've seen them. It's amazing. They're like sitting under this little tent in like 118 degree weather in August. And you're like, I don't think the tent is really doing anything. Um, and they're sitting there with all these jars of honey that they have Mate, I love that. I love fresh honey. It's so good for you. And did you know that it takes one bee an entire lifetime to make a teaspoon of honey? That's a bee's life work. And you're like putting it in your green tea and you're like, that's too sweet. Just make me another cup. (laughs) That bee is looking through the window like I spent, (laughs) spent my entire life doing that teaspoon like was it was it that sweet could you not have just added more tea like do you not understand how things work uh, I was at world market a couple weeks ago and they had this product which was honey inside of like a honeycomb square in like a box and I was like is this where we're at now 
like you're destroying these bees home to have like a, a, a nicer case for your, for your product here. Um, honey is a symbol in the Bible of sweetness. You know, 35, 40 times in the Old Testament, it says, I'm taking you to a land flowing with what? Do you know? Milk and honey, exactly. I'm taking you to a land flowing, overflowing with milk that is strength and honey that is sweetness. I am bringing you, God said, to a place, out of slavery, to a place where I will bring sweetness into your life. Have you ever been at a place where life just felt sour and needed some sweetness? Have you ever been at the place where you are ashamed of the wrinkles in your journal because you're kind of crying onto it more than you're writing? Um, have, you ever, have you ever been at a place where you are in so much pain from something horrible that happened to you, where you are just like, man, like, I'm gonna keep going to church, but like, not really. Like, I'm just gonna look at my phone, you know. I, I, have, I have been there. I have been to that place where you're like, I love, I don't, I don't know if you can relate to this or not, but where you're like, I love God and I'm always gonna love God and I love Christ. But like, m- maybe I've had enough of the rest of it, you know? Because you got hurt or wounded from the people that the Bible told you were gonna be unified with you or whatever, There is something monumental that happens in your heart, in your body, and in your brain when you believe this truth from Scripture. When you believe this thing, that God brings beauty from brokenness. And man, it's hard. It's hard to believe And God can handle it today if you pray to him and say, God, I don't believe this right now. Can you help me believe it? I've been chatting with people from this church for a few weeks and connecting with people. And I've noticed a through line in so many people's stories. I've met so many people. I've met so many of you in the lobby hanging out or I baptized you or we talked at a coffee shop. I've met so many people from this church at coffee shops. That makes me so happy because I love coffee and wasting time too. Um, and (laughs) like working on a sermon, someone's like, I go to your church. I'm like, amazing. Now I cannot work on this. Hi, nice to talk to you. Do you want to sit down? Um, (laughs) and the through line in so many stories, hanging with Kevin, hanging with the board and learning the history of this church is there's like a lot of pain and hurt. And that's a rock. And what would happen? What would happen if everyone here believed what the Bible says, which is that God doesn't want to bring sweetness to Mission Church at the corner of Elliot and Power in spite of the difficult things that we've been through, but that God wants to bring sweetness to this room and to this place and to these hearts from that place, from that place. So I've been studying for a while. I've been studying these ideas and, oh, there was another one. I forgot, Israel and Jesus. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Sorry, Lord. So I've been studying for a while, why does God allow this? And I've come up with the answer. Um, The answer is that I don't know. Um, (laughs) Too many jokes in this sermon. Stop laughing, people are gonna think I'm just messing around. Um, I don't know why God allows pain in our life, but he does, and, and that's enough. Faith says that's enough. And man, I can't make that make sense for a person who doesn't know God, because it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. 
Everyone else in the world, when they go through hard things, self-medicates, makes a massive change in their life, abandons their responsibilities, or does whatever people in the world do. And, you know, I would probably do that too if I didn't know Christ. I can't make this make sense to someone in the world because it doesn't make sense. It only makes sense to people who know Christ. And that's enough. Faith says believing in what God says is enough. This is a guy named Arthur Graves, and he was born maybe, I don't know, like 100 years ago. Oh, here, I've got it written down. He was born in 1856 in Massachusetts. He was born like 170 years ago. And he was raised by Christian parents. His mother died, um, his father died when he was nine years old. So he lived with his single mom until she died when he turned 12, she died of tuberculosis. And so it's the 1850s, 1860s, and he is an orphan, and he gets sent to live on a farm with a family who will basically let him live there in exchange for work. So he's working like a full adult male workload at the age of 12 with strangers, with no parents, and they were so rough and abusive on him that he developed epilepsy, and he had epileptic seizures when he was a teenager. And he just pushed through and went all the way through and got to college and decided to go to Bible college because his parents who passed away were Christians. And he went to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which is actually the same school that I went to. And when he got there, he heard about a preacher who was doing some sort of healing event. And he drove to Minneapolis in the 1870s and went to this event and was healed of his epilepsy. And he never had a seizure again for the entire rest of his life. And then he wrote a hymn and started writing all of these hymns. And he wrote this hymn about Psalm 81. He said, oh brother, do you know the savior who's wondrous, kind, and true? He's the rock of salvation, and there's honey in the rock for you. He said, have you tasted that the Lord is gracious? Do you walk in the way that's new? Have you drunk from the living fountain? There's honey in the rock for you. Do you pray to God the Father? What will you have me do? Never fear, he will surely answer. There's honey in the rock for you. And he believed something that I'm pitching to you today that you would believe, which is that no matter what difficult thing comes into your life, that you would believe that God loves you, that he sees you, that he cares about you, that he's measured the difficulty. And it is more than you can handle, but it's not more than you can handle with him. And that he's allowed things in your life for reasons that you can't understand and you might never understand, but that he will bring good things into your life from that place. That belief changes a lot. That belief changes a lot of things. And I'd love if we could pray together right now. I wanna to invite you to pray a prayer of surrender. So if this is something that is hitting you where you're at, we're gonna spend a few minutes in prayer right now or if it's something that you really needed this morning, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad you came to church. So glad you didn't let your pain keep you far from church. When you wake up in pain or when you have a hangover after you made a mistake or when you wake up regretting your weekend's decisions or when you had a huge fight or with your wife or whatever, don't let those things keep you from church. That's the morning you need church the most. You come on over and hang out with us. We're all, we're all going through it too, it's okay. And so we're gonna pray now. I'd invite you if, uh, to open your hands in your lap if you'd like to receive from the Lord. It's not a magic position. It really is a symbol of what is in our hearts, which is that we believe that we receive from the Lord. Church is a place where we minister to God first and foremost. And church is a place where we receive blessing from God. We receive favor from God. We receive uh, mindsets from God. That's called repentance. We receive uh, good news from the word. We receive fellowship from saints. We receive uh, pleasure and joy from worshiping God. And we receive uh, 
purpose in pain. Because as Christians, we don't shy away from our pain. We're the bravest people in the world. We look at it in the face and say, Jesus got through it and he's standing next to me and I'll get through it too. I'll get through it with him and he'll be with me and he won't leave me and he knows and he's felt it. Whatever's the worst pain that you've ever felt, Jesus felt one that's worse and he got through it and he's with you. And so if, if you wanna pray with me, uh, we're gonna pray a prayer of surrender right now to God. You can repeat after me or you can pray um, whatever you want. God is listening. He can hear all of us at the same time. God, we surrender our pain to you. You could repeat that after me or you could say it in your own words. God, I surrender my pain to you. God, show me what is sweet in my life. God, bring me to the place where I see the sweetness that comes from suffering. Yes, Lord, we live in a posture of surrender towards you because you are good, because we believe that you have a purpose and a plan, because we care about you, God, because we believe what you say in the word, because we believe that if we would just listen to you, that you would bring good from difficulty. We believe it where we do not believe it. Would you align our hearts and minds with the truth? Would you allow us, God, to let go of lies that we've believed because of pain or lies that we've believed because of hurt, that you're not good, that you don't care, that you don't listen, that you're not making something good, that you're not working things together for good? Those are lies. We do not believe those things in this place. That's not the truth. The truth is that you do, that you care, that you're here that you're sewing things together into a tapestry of goodness that would shock us if we could see all of it and that we'll laugh when we're with you in heaven over the pains that we've endured as hard as they are. So I pray a prayer of faith over someone today who's been really struggling and they did not want the sermon to be about this this morning because it's too much pain and if they're trying to avoid it, which is a natural human reaction, I just pray for that person today. Would you bless them today, God? Would you grant to them faith Faith comes by hearing. Would they hear truth in this sermon this morning? Would they have heard truth and have received faith directly from you to them that would activate things in their life and would allow them to face their pain head on and say, Jesus is with me. I believe it. I surrender to his plan. I surrender to his will. I've done a bad job being in control of my life. God, you are in control of my life. Would you help that person today, God? Would you bless them today? Would you put joy in their heart that they cannot generate from their mind, brain, or body? Would you give them that spiritual joy? Jesus, would you bring abundant life to their life? God, would you show us where the sweetness comes from the rock? God, those of us who are living in the middle of the rock right now, like life is hard right now, would you give us faith to believe what you say? that you are bringing things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose, that we would be able to say by faith what Joseph said, which is they may have meant it for evil, but God meant it.